Right, we'll give it just about one more minute uh, for attendees to join, and then we'll get started. All right. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending which side of the world you're on here. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, Marvin discussion. We'll be talking about designing for healthier and happier living with three uh, premier designers uh, from different uh, corners of the country. Um, some of the um, ideas that we're going to explore today are going to be um, to discuss how when we're spending more time here at home than ever before with COVID, you know, we're just more uniquely aware of the impact that the spaces we occupy have on our health and our cognitive performance. And so we recently learned that that trend is, is paying forward to architects and more than half of architects are having conversations specific to well-being uh, in ways that uh, we've not seen in the market before. So we'd like to see these discussions become more commonplace as our panel might agree. And here at Marvin, we are focused and dedicated to developing products and, and expertise that can help to foster uh, happier and healthier living uh, in tandem with the work of designers like our guests today. Um, so we'd like to uh, take this time to speak with these professionals uh, about designing homes that foster this sense of well-being and happiness, and maybe some of the shifts that we see occurring uh, in a difficult year. Um, I just want to let everyone know, please submit your questions in the question and answer answer feature at the base of your page and not in the chat feature. And uh, I'll allocate about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation to get to about as many uh, questions as I can. I also want to let everyone know that we are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our Marvin YouTube channel. So if you have any colleagues or friends or family that are interested, feel free to uh, share that with them. Um, just really excited about today's discussion. I'm very passionate about this topic, uh, both in my work here with Marvin and uh, personally. Um, and so I'd just like to introduce our panel. Um, first, our, uh, our uh, attendee here from Queens, New York, we have John Patrick Winbury. Uh, John is a partner and uh, a team leader at the UP Studio. Um, and he finds a, you know, a genesis of um, the genesis of a new project to be the most thrilling stage of, of his production and his work. Uh, he's been working as an architect for over 15 years, and he really likes to focus around a, a custom design concept for his clientele. Um, he's dedicated to managing his clients' expectations throughout the life of a project, and specifically expanding the brand of UP um, by being proactive and transparent to the key uh, to success. And alongside his architectural practice, uh, John also lectures at the New York Institute of Technology, and he's also been an active design critic for a number of architectural schools around the country. And additionally, uh, John is an active member of the Architecture League in New York. So John, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's really nice to meet you. And uh, with that, we're going to introduce Jacqueline Whitaker. Uh, Jacqueline is a senior vice president, AIA and well faculty member She's also a lead accredited professional, and she is the senior vice president at uh, IWBI, or the International Wellbeing Institute. Um, she served within uh, IWBI as the commercial uh, team leader, uh, as well as leader for international uh, development. Um, she leads a team with highly proficient experts in, in well requirements, the features and intentions and certification processes involved with the well standard. And she's really just been intermeshed instrumental in IWBI membership, as well as the a Well Portfolio Provider Program and development and operations. She has an extensive sustainability and design and consulting background uh, with a focus in wellness design, uh, where she uh, first expanded those 
those tools was with Delos project management team. And she worked closely with construction professionals and owners to help to incorporate the well building standard into projects. And she also managed uh, a project I'm familiar with and some of the teammates that I know here uh, in Rochester, Minnesota at the Well Living Lab, which is on the campus of the, the Mayo Clinic here. Um, she also led the sustainability department for a New York City architectural firm uh, named HLW, where she provided lead sustainability and wellness consulting. And prior to that, she also has a, a great deal of valuable custom residential design experience. Um, so Jacqueline is, remains a licensed architect, a proud graduate of the University of Kentucky School of Architecture, and she really brings a lot to the well-being and sustainability community. Um, so again, just thank you so much, Jacqueline, for, for joining us. We're really excited to have you. Uh, and next and, and last but not least, we have David Strand. Um, I know David. David's a, a great architect here in Minneapolis, and we work together on projects here and there. Uh, David was raised in a small Wisconsin town. He comes from a family of craftspersons, artists, and builders that spans over four generations. Uh, it's really in David's blood. You know, after uh, high school, he went uh, to the uh, Twin Cities where he got his education in architectural design. And he really developed a passion for architecture and creating new awareness for building and design uh, with some new perspectives. Um, he's worked at a small commercial firm so uh, like our other guests here, he has a, a experience both in commercial and some custom residential design. And through that commercial work, he was able to really sharpen his drafting and client relations skills uh, that has served him in his own firm uh, at Strand Design. He's eager for more experience in design and high quality building, as well as the, uh, the concepts of well-being and sustainability and comfort in the home. And um, David has been successfully designing and building uh, for the greater Northwest for a number of time. Um, and aside from that, he's also spent some time in New York City where he worked uh, with some high profile construction management companies. So David, it's very nice to see you and uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. So I was going to um, kick it off with a, a question really just asking you know, each of you to maybe talk about how your background and your experiences that I just mentioned really shaped your approach and to bring you to a place where you're designing for happier and healthier living. Uh, David, would you maybe like to get us started? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, well, background wise, I grew up in a rural remote area and there really wasn't a lot of awareness of, of architecture, of health. <laughs> I think we were happy there, um, maybe because there was no traffic. But um, it was there was it was a very different world up there, and um, it was a great upbringing. But it definitely made everything that is the city is modern day is is kind of was new to me when I moved out of there. So I think there was kind of an uh, eye opening experience to move to the cities and kind of begin this journey in architecture and. So I, I think that's, that's kind of the basis for my experience is just really kind of seeing it when I was um, very um, impressionable as, you know, an 18, 20 year old. So um, was, was there the health and wellness question too? Um, yeah, maybe just speaking to you know, your practice today and, yeah. and how you're approaching the concept of designing yeah. for happier and healthier living and maybe how has that changed in recent uh, recent times? Yeah, I mean, I think it, for us, it just starts with listening to our client. You know, I think it's such a subjective thing, happiness, you know? So is it, what, what do our clients need to be happy? It's not necessarily, for us, it's not necessarily the technical details. It's, you know, it's one is giving them what, they are looking for. And a lot of times we have to really um, kind of work through, translate, decipher what that is. We, we do programming, but they don't always know how to ask for it and, and what they're going for. So we challenge our clients and kind of translate their, their desires. And from there, it's just, it's creating, I don't know, like movement. It's creating 
uh, light. It's it's creating a space that we feel really good in. So I don't think I'll talk too much about the technical aspects of it. It's just more about creating a space that we're excited about that moves us from the inside to the outside and vice versa. You know, it's creating small intimate spaces and it's creating large volumes where you can gather. And I think it's creating purposeful spaces, you know, just to make sure that we're drawn to the spaces that we want to be in. Um, we don't need four living rooms, you know, or if we do have those, we make sure that, that we're drawn to them and we don't have to kind of have a conversation for 10 minutes about which one we'll go sit in. So I think, I think it's a lot about that for us is just really being, uh, just make sure everything makes sense and it's light and it's happy and it's healthy. And from there, it's also, you know, financial and everything. It's, I think we view something that we spend $10 on very differently than what we spend a hundred dollars on. So with that in mind, I think it's making sure that we respect those budgets and that we achieve those and what those people see as valuable is what we put our attention towards. And then, you know, maybe some of the things that we think are valuable, but we learn that they don't really care about, we need to kind of acquiesce and, and let those go. So really it's, it's just so, so subjective and so holistic to just really providing a space that promotes happiness to us. Right. Very well put. Thank you, David. And I thought um, maybe I'll go to John since he's uh, working more in uh, custom residential architecture at present to kind of play off what David's comments, you know, so beyond the, you know, focusing on the goals and the needs of the client and early planning and schematic design, John, could you maybe speak to design development through, you know, early uh, final drawing stages, you know, what do those conversations seem like today that may be different concerning uh, health and well-being? in your decision-making for your designs. Yeah, thanks, Marco. Um, I think it's one of those things, uh, I think uh, our studio is aligned with David's uh, and Strand in the sense that we're trying to think about it holistically, not just at the concept and programming or schematic design stage, but like you had mentioned, in design development all the way through CDs and CA, uh, we're really trying to constantly be challenging ourselves uh, on the performance of the buildings that we're designing, um, but also questioning why we're doing everything that we're doing all the way through, you know, the extreme detailing that we're trying to execute on our projects. But even if we zoom out to the more concept driven stuff, we're trying to make sure that it's kind of embedded holistically into every kind of gesture or every move that we make in the project, that there's a there's a foundation of why, like why are we putting the four living rooms that David had mentioned? You know, is there a need for that? And if there's not, let's let's as a as a collaboration figure out what the actual correct uh, uh, distribution of program is, so we can really exploit the site uh, for for its best value. I mean, I think from our studio's perspective, we use the path of the sun as a guiding principle for our architecture. Um, it's why almost all four of our facades are always different. Um, the architecture is kind of reacting to its site in a really, really um, straightforward way. And we want to be really, really smart about how we, how we do that. And then as it progresses into design development, we're constantly challenging ourselves to rethink what we initially did and how do we kind of tighten that process up and, and get it um, more refined and, and, and smarter. And to David's point about budget, you know, we're constantly kind of talking about that because as a, when we first started, it didn't really matter because we're just designing and we're having fun. But now, you know, as you progress in a studio, you start to understand obviously the, the budget being one of the key drivers of a project and how do you integrate those discussion on day one rather than design something really exciting and then have to value engineer it out and all that stuff. So we're trying to, we're trying to really prod ourselves early on in the process to make sure that we're being really, really um, kind of straightforward and transparent in our decision making for our clients to make sure that they understand why we're doing what we're doing. Great. Thank you so much, John. And uh, Jacqueline, uh, perhaps you could play off that. You have such a dynamic background, but maybe to your present duties with IWBI, um, how are you seeing a different approach to 
uh, your team's work in, in fostering happier and healthier living through your projects and your uh, and, and the team. Sure. Yeah, that's that's great. And happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me and in. already inspired by this panel. So I um, appreciate it. It's a fun one. Um, I actually started my career in the custom residential um, and I do, I in, uh, mostly single family and based in Chicago. And I do think that there is a special place in heaven for, um, for people that, that do custom residential design. Um, John, you mentioned the extreme detailing. It really takes a lot of um, attention to detail um, to be able to do that work. So I'm hugely and wholly appreciative um, of your work. And I migrated my career into sustainability a number of years later after my internship. Um, and it's funny, um, so I did a sustainability consulting within a large architecture firm in New York City. And um, so I, you know, I worked alongside my fellow colleagues in this and that. And I, at some point along the way, I had an ex or an old professor that had said, you know, I was really grappling with this idea of, of stepping out of a traditional architecture role and, and moving into sort of a more sustainability consulting role. And he said, you know, if you get your license, you're always an architect. So um, that's what I ended up doing. And I still am sort of plagued by these CEUs that I <laughs> have to continue to, to track down. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I, I merged into sustainability consulting and my main client at HLW and my primary focus was for uh, Google New York, who everyone knows has a healthy and experienced workplace initiative and sort of eth baked into their, their ethos. So, um, you know, I really got this um, concept of healthy indoor spaces um, experience in that even before knowing about the well building standard. Um, and in fact, it was a natural jump to, uh, to make the move over to IWBI, the International Well Building Institute, back in 2014. Um, so what we are, what I do at IWBI is I'm on the commercial team. I am really focused on supporting our technical users. So whether that's architects or engineers, sustainability professionals, sometimes savvy um, in-house owners to make them or to make those practitioners and those consultants and those uh, service providers, the smart one in the room with their clients. And David, you mentioned uh, the values of your clients and the goals of your clients. Um, but you know, that's really what I focus in on is making sure that those technical uh, users and those designers are able to do that um, effectively. Um, we have a number of programs that we've rolled out at IWBI. I mean, starting with sort of our backbone of the well building standard, um, which was launched in version one back in 2014. And we've recently evolved it to, to version two. Um, most recently, we have launched the health safety, the well health safety rating, and it is um, a program that is intended to address our current crisis. Um, we fully recognize that our programs were deficient when it came to communicable disease as well, and particularly around, you know, pre prevention, preparedness, resiliency, and recovery. So that's where we are. Um, I work mostly with commercial um, and institutional clients or or designers who provide uh, or do work for those sorts of uh, clients, but we, you know, I'm finding, and I could, I could speak, and I'm kind of getting chills thinking about it. I could speak about a lot of different examples where people have taken what their companies, their office spaces um, have done for their health of employees and taking it in, into their own homes, into their homes, their, the way they're eating, um, so on and so forth. So it just is really kind of a fun one to think about the implications of in, incorporating healthy indoor space um, interventions um, at any different aspect or any different scale. Very well put, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And, you know, I've experienced it now that I'm in the home office in the basement more than ever this year. You finally put in that egress window, right? To get into some natural <laughs> light. Uh, at Marvin, we have uh, a number of our offices, one of which is going to be pursuing the well, the well standard. But, you know, from a, a personal level with friends, family, you hear things like, man, I, I hate, I didn't care for my at home office, but now that I'm in it all the time, I really want to redesign it. Like, I really hate it now. Um, and so just the way that pandemic has informed all the ways that we see our spaces differently. Uh, J John, could you start with just the question, like, how do you see uh, interest in designing differently from your clients this year 
for uh, custom designs or renovations? And, you know, just how is that, in, is there an increased interest in well-being and, and you know, pandemic kind of caused um, discussions on your, on your designs? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate the question. I, I definitely think um, that we're all, as a profession, uh, trying to kind of react on our feet. Um, and we definitely have seen a significant increase. Um, our studio is, is positioned uh, to work with families in and around New York City. And so we've seen a significant increase in interest of, of family homes uh, in, in those areas um, and, and working with families to help um, kind of create uh, safe havens for them to feel very comfortable in. Um, but I do think it's a really, um, it's a challenging question because I, I think um, from our studio's perspective, I don't know if we wanna be uh, so reactionary in the sense that there are some holistic things that we believe are backbones to uh, healthy living and healthy design spaces. Um, and again, path of the sun and, and all of those things that are gonna kind of inform our architecture We've always been really, really proud that that's been baked into every single one of our projects. I do think though that there's a, a different way to think about it now programmatically because you know, who knows, let's say in the next three to five years, um, the home office is, is a more utilized space inside of a home. There does become a dynamic of public and private um, and kind of work life and home life that, it, that is merged together in a, in a very, very quick way for the entire you know, society. And I think architecturally speaking, uh, we're really intrigued on what that means programmatically. And is there a way that we can separate that a little better? Whether, you know, again, a, a piece of the volume kind of snaps off and it kind of lives independently from the structure or if it is integrated into the structure, um, how do we still give that, that peace of mind that we're disconnecting those zones if someone is looking to disconnect that? So I think that's been a lot of the questions from our clients that do want to uh, engage more of a work at home uh, type of process in their, in their early design strategy. Um, and I think it's something that we're just honestly still working out. I mean, I think we're, we're, we've always had home offices built into our projects, but obviously not thinking that they were going to be used 100% of the time. Um, so I do think we want to think about it. And I, I think Jacqueline's experience um, and her comment about um, architects pulling some of that information from the commercial side into the residential is something that we're a thousand percent on board with. And we want to figure out ways to create that well-being for our clients. And I do think the separation between work and, and family life is something that is going to be challenged uh, from the residential side for, for the next couple of years. And I think we do need to figure out solutions to create that balance um, because I don't know uh, if the other panelists agree, but I do think if you're working at home, you know, where does the clock stop? And, and those things are, are, have become a really big issue for some of our clients of they're feeling a little kind of overwhelmed, obviously by everything that's happening, but still not being able to make that disconnection. Um, so I do think there is a really interesting solution architecturally of how we could help in that conversation. Uh, we're excited to to implement that in the next couple of years. Wonderful, thank you for that. And um, you know, maybe Jacqueline, we could uh, pass it on to you to maybe those concepts of things that you're seeing that are different, uh, if anything, this year with the pandemic. And like, what are some of the major, maybe recent discussions that you've had, maybe concerning well-being that have risen to the forefront recently that you feel were um, maybe pandemic and, and driven by this time. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just kind of going back to, you know, I appreciate John, you mentioning that, you know, the off, the home office has now become this place that's just completely different than what it was 10 months ago. Um, I'm sitting in my bedroom, <laughs> as you could see. Um, and it's funny, I, you know, it, we've all had to figure it out, right? Um, and it's, it, it is funny too, that kind of anything goes, I mean, seeing pets and beds and, you know, kids and everything, it kind of, it, it all goes, uh, anything goes at this point. So 
Um, you know, even in the most serious of meetings, sometimes people are wearing t-shirts. So, you know, you kind of uh, you have to just figure it out along the way. But, um, you know, there's certainly, I mean, I'm case in point, we actually, my, my family, we moved from New York City recently and purchased a home and actually embarking on renovating a a historic 125 year old home. So I'm getting ready to sharpen that custom residential design <laughs> um, expertise I started out with. But, um, you know, we're, we're figuring it out. So but a lot of things, you know, that that at least I personally and I know that others that have been focused on health in their own environments, whether it's the office, whether it's the home, um, you know, there's, they're focusing on like natural light. I know we've talked, John, you mentioned that, you know, following the, the path of the sun, but talking about natural and artificial light and designing for that appropriately, um, maximizing natural light as well and incorporating biophilia and just plantings or natural materials. Marco, I love that your, your background has natural materials. It's just really lovely and calming um, and soothing. And personally, you know, avoidance of toxicants. I know that that, you know, the healthy architectural product um, conversation has been something that's been kind of around for some time now, but just sort of avoiding VOCs, avoiding PVC if possible, avoiding some of these this toxicants um, in our building products, but then also in our cleaning materials and whether it's at home or the office, there's so much that can be implemented. Um, I know that we're now all working. Um, so my my chair is is not a good example of an ergonomic <laughs> situation. <laughs> However, it's I've remedied that. It's, I've got one coming. Um, so, you know, ergonomics are huge. And so just thinking about you know, sit stand desks at home and thinking about it in, in a residential scale versus what we're used to at the office, maybe. Uh, but having ergonomic furniture and the ability to, I mean, I'm, I'm not one to actually moves around a lot. I mean, living in New York City, you at least got that commute, right? You, you know, had to walk to the train and get on the train and you walk to the office. So it was, I figured plus or minus, I was sort of walking two miles a day at minimum, not going to the gym, but at minimum. But now sometimes I don't leave my house. And so just that lack of physical activity is a huge one and sort of figuring out how to incorporate that in the home environment um, in a different way that than before. Um, you know, how a, uh, your home is maintained is a huge one. So, um, you know, making sure that filters are changed, whether that's on your, your water or your, um, you know, air supply. Um, we actually just purchased an air purification system. And what's crazy about it is that it kicks on. Um, you know, I thought we haven't really gotten into major construction in the main part of the house, but um, it kicks on when we cook. And so, you know, and those are not super, not harmful VOCs, but, um, you know, it's just, there's a lot of really wonderful things that, you know, that we can take from this, you know, our work environment in the well building standard and, and achieving well certification um, in our home environment. Um, what we have done, and I mentioned the well health safety rating and that we launched it, um, it's a little different of a program. And it's, in fact, I've heard some people mention that it's well light. Um, if anyone on the line knows about well certification, it's quite a rigorous uh, program to achieve. And we're really excited, Marco, about your, your headquarters project and uh, looking forward to celebrating that, that award. Um, but it, what it requires is on-site testing. So testing for air quality, water quality, acoustics, lighting, um, and any of the environment, some aspects of thermal comfort that can be measured in the environment itself. So as you can imagine, there's a lot um, that goes into that. So it's a pretty high bar, um, but performance data is key, right? In ensuring that a space is truly healthy. Um, with the health safety rating, we took a little bit of a different approach, fully recognizing that when we launched this program in July, there was no on-site test that could tell us that there's COVID in, in the space. And so we made it a documentation-based program and that it's focused on operations and maintenance, um, really. Um, and some also some aspects of requiring an understanding of what outdoor air supply could um, be achieved. And so, um, so, so anyway, that's a little bit of a, a different approach that we've taken uh, with the building standard uh, or with the well products generally. 
Um, but what is nice about it is that there are quite a lot of things that are found within that rating that can be applied in a residential setting as well, although it is a lot of focus on operations and maintenance um, and preparedness and resiliency. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that uh, dynamic response. I think, uh, you know, the things that are moving forward with uh, the health safety rating is just is a really, ex really exciting for the, the well being and sustainability community. Um, and, you know, you speak about materials and off gassing, I think COVID has made people more aware that, you know, maybe not all homeowners thought about the air in their home as being fresh air that cycled in. And maybe there is an interest in air exchanges now like there wasn't before, perhaps. Um, you know, I think the context of thinking of energy efficiency is often synonymous with, uh, with well-being. Like sometimes the most efficient products are also helping to provide. And so with ventilation in mind and, you know, talking about sun path being important, uh, I know it's important for David as well. David, could you kind of speak to um, maybe ventilation considerations with, uh, with walls and with and those types of systems and how those help to uh, shepherd your design uh, decision-making processes? Yeah, you know, um, this might be a better question for Jacqueline, but I will try and answer it. Um, I think, you know, part of it is, is who is the client? You know, we, we, we in the design world love to de design very specific things for very specific purposes, but we also kind of consider real estate and we consider what is the resale value and what is the next user if there is. So with beyond those items, it's kind of thinking about you know, who is the client and, and how do they live in that space? So if for us, it's, um, you know, maybe the windows aren't being opened all the time because they do have allergies. So are there allergies and are they in a situation where there's a lot of noise and they can't leave the windows open at night? You know, so it's really considering the environment and then who's in it. So it might be, it might be how do we get it to the inside of the home? So we want to make sure we get that fresh air in, we draw the bad air out, and that we we make sure that it's it's being mechanically driven. Um, I think there's a lot of clients that we have too that they really want to open up their house. And so a part of that is getting those operable windows or or you know huge bifold doors and drop down screens and all these kinds of things. So I think it's, we address it in two very different ways, depending on who the client is, but we've always have to have the other one as supplemental because it's, it's, there's a winter here and there's a hot summer here. And so we can't really, we always have to be able to, you know, flip flop between mechanical and, you know, and passive ways and just very natural ways of doing it. So I think we, we consider it with just in kind of every form we can. And I think it's just reevaluating. I mean, John and I both like the word programming a lot. I can tell um, it's something in the design world. We, we, that is so important, you know, and so it's figuring out who people are and, and it, part of it goes back to that healthy and, you know, home office, all this kind of stuff. A lot of these things are things that we've been doing all along in our profession. We just haven't been maybe valuing them as much. It's that home office where we've always stuck one in, but we, we talked about it for about five minutes with the client and we talked about the kitchen for about 20 days, you know? So it's making sure that we talk about all these items that are now more relevant and they're more important. And I think, the air and what we're breathing and what we're seeing and all that stuff is so important. So I guess that's what I would say about it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Marco, if, yes. if I could just follow up with that, because I, I think, I think David do. brings yes, up something super interesting. Um, and, it, and Jacqueline had touched on it too. And it's, it's funny, as we were talking about this, I was thinking, of, you know, we're talking about the home office as this entity that's like, what is it? And it's, it's all this, it, now it's being used again by almost everybody all the time, but it makes me think 
circle back 10 months ago, there are establishments in and around in, in kind of rural and suburban areas where there are communities that have, you know, uh, an accountant that works out of his house. And he always has. It hasn't been like a, a it's always been built in there. So the thing that's pretty interesting, and I've never, it just literally, we're, we're talking about it right now. And, and David's thing about the, you know, the two minutes on the, you know, the 12 by 12 room in the back versus, you know, four 400 hours on, you know, where we're putting <laughs> our spices, um, I think is a really interesting conversation. But there also is this really amazing set of data of people who've actually done this their entire lives. And I think it's like, it, I, you know, it, it's pretty interesting of like, it would be a pretty uh, interesting data pool to pull of like, how were they able to kind of create that wellness inside of their work and, and personal life balance by being home all the time? Like what, you know, we all see some of the benefits of, you know, uh, Jacqueline's commute is is now gone. And some people love that because they're saving right? Like two hours a day uh, is back into their life. But then you have to augment that with actually activity and, and, and all those things. So there's, there's all these like push and pull. But I just, I don't know why it just struck me like, wow, there, there are people that have done this their entire lives. And can <laughs> we mine some of the pros and cons that they've done uh, in, in, in how they've been able to create that balance? And maybe they'll tell us that there is no balance, right? And like what we're all experiencing right now, that the blurring of those lines is, is just inherent in working and living, you know, uh, in, in the same space. But I just think it's kind of interesting to, I, I literally like drove by a surveyor the other day and he like worked out of his house and I was like, huh, should ask him how he's done this his whole career. Like it's an interesting <laughs> little dynamic that I never thought of until 10 months ago when we all were forced to radically think about it instantly. So yeah, just something, something that just popped up, nothing. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's very, it's fascinating. And, and we, uh, we think about the, one of the well concepts that's addressed, which is free address. And, you know, John, you kind of spoke to it too. Maybe you are differentiating and separating the home. Maybe the home design is, might be less open now that people have to work from home. Just that concept of free address, which refers to opportunity to find refuge, um, you know, and escape. And, and perhaps, so perhaps that says there, may, there might be a shift away from more open floor plans. I do get to see a, a whole lot of architects plans in my work with Marvin. And I have noticed just maybe as a closing comment on the office is that it's often buried and hidden, right? It's, it's, I tend to see it kind of as the, not just the afterthought in the design, but it's kind of put in that corner, right? Maybe not a featured space where it gets a lot of good natural light. Uh, but it's really interesting. I also want to just pause briefly and mention that a lot of these concepts we're talking about, and particularly um, with Well, the Well website, um, when you go to the website and check out the features, if anybody on the call is not familiar with Well, they go through each of the 100 plus features, and it's very, very accessible um, to read those features and even for a homeowner to really understand like what's going on. And so any of these concepts we're talking about that you might be familiar with, uh, it's just a really, really great resource um, to help kind of understand biomimicry and, and daylighting versus task lighting and, and some of these concepts. Um, I thought we could um, perhaps uh, back to, to David, John, Jacqueline, I'll just open the floor. Like, could you speak to, I know it's difficult since we're not sharing screens, but what are some recent projects that you've worked on that may be um, some like exemplary examples of designing for well-being that maybe are unique, whether you've been, you know, practicing projects like them for a long time. Um, maybe just speak to some of those, those concepts that were interesting for uh, specific projects. Maybe Jacqueline, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I, you know, I don't have a whole lot to contribute um, to, to this, but I do, I mean, what, what we're finding is that this trend of healthy indoor spaces, it's not, it, it's here to stay. It's sort of foundational. And David, I love that you said that, you know, you, you've been designing or architects have been designing for healthy spaces for since the Renaissance. I mean, you can, we could argue that like since the beginning of architecture as a, as a traditional and a, an official profession. Um, but I think there's an opportunity right now to really highlight that and to really talk about that. 
um, in a really unique way. And I, another thing um, you mentioned too is that this topic, when it comes to residential, it's so personal, right? Um, I mean, health in general, when it comes to your environment is so personal anyway. What we've done at well is we've made it, <laughs> we've standardized it. We're trying to make it flexible enough so that that people, I mean, Marco, you mentioned this sort of locus of control and sort of free address and that kind of thing. And we've we've built a standard that encourage, <laughs> encourages flexibility. So that's a little bit contradictory, a little bit um, in, a, in a way. But I do love that you address that, you know, designing for health or designing for a well space or well indoor space is so personal and so unique to the individual. I mean, we, I think we talked about someone with, or you'd mentioned something, someone with allergies. Um, and so that really gets back to sort of the values and the goals of your clients, right? Um, but when it comes to projects, so back to your question, um, you know, we, like I said, it's sort of early in the, in the hour is, we're really delighted um, and, and not surprised um, to see that the, our standard has really held out up in sort of these extreme, um, in the extreme measures, right, extreme time. Um, but it's here to stay, you know, because everyone cares about their health. I mean, or they, their children or their parents or their families, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we've used the term and particularly Rick Fadrizi, who was the co-founder of the USGBC and now um, has stepped in at, at IWBI, but he uses this term, the second wave of sustainability. And it's because, you know, you can't, it's very, very hard to quantify health in a space, right? You can, you can quantify energy and air savings, right? You can do that. You can put dollars, you know, associate dollars, savings to that. But when it comes to health, happiness, productivity, all of those things that are focused on wellness, it's very, very hard. And then by the time we get to that point where we're able to say, to put a dollar, an ROI figure next to that, then we've, it's too late, right? <laughs> so anyway, this idea of, of health in the built environment is, it's here, it's foundational. And I do, I think designers really have, architects, designers have this really unique moment to sort of really talk about that and say, well, we've been doing this. So, um, you know, we'll continue to do it. It's not, it's, it's business as usual at this point. You know, that's just really well put because, you know, measuring productivity is tricky. And like you said, once you do measure it, the space is already done and occupied and uh, you know, where are those opportunities if their you know, productivity wasn't increased? And what you're saying, Jacqueline, just really made me think of, right, it's just the general standard of care that an architect provides for a client is to do right by them, as you said, and to do right by the public um, and society at large. And, and that's really what we all want to do, which is take care of each other. And, um, you know, what would a reasonably prudent architect do? So I think maybe there is just a a renewed focus and interest in what architect and design looks like uh, from the consumer level and perhaps more value and appreciation for it this year uh, more than ever. Um, John, would you like to speak to maybe a specific project or example, anything um, that um, you find to be unique this, this year or last? Yeah, so we're, we're working on a project right now that's under construction uh, that we call um, maybe a slight play on words, Jacqueline, but uh, we call it the Living Well House. Um, and it was an interesting study for us where we were um, trying to figure out a way to get natural light to the core of the home. So it's a landlocked home in the sense that it's got kind of properties on either side that are very close. So the setbacks in this particular community are pretty snug. So um, the house, um, you know, we were struggling with ways of actually bringing natural light um, into the project. And what we ended up doing is kind of carving out a center void um, in the center of the home. We made this, the home a perfect square, and then we carved out a void in the center uh, and extruded it up, uh, allowing the, the natural light to come down. And then we're going to plant that entire well, that like living well that we're calling it, um, and we're gonna plant it all the way down all three stories. So there's natural vegetation that's gonna be happening in the core of the home. Um, and then we're gonna 
kind of really plant heavily plant the home on, on all sides as well. Um, so that was one that that um, we were, were we're really excited about. It's it's again like midway through construction right now, and you're already seeing the benefits of bringing the natural light into a home uh, of that proportion, which again is always super tricky when you're on a really snug property. Um, so yeah, that's one that we're that we're really really excited about right now. That sounds fascinating. Do you have that uh, posted yet on your online portfolio, perchance? Uh, yeah, it's on it's on our webpage. Uh, little little ways down, we usually uh, put the ones that are built a little further up. But yeah, it's a little a little ways down on the, on the site, um, and we're really really excited about it. Very nice. Look forward to looking into that. And you you had a client asking for uh, that they said living well was important, and you made a living well directly. You just <laughs> you took the, <laughs> the I mean, I think yeah. they. Yeah, they, they said to us that they wanted uh, they wanted like a, a, a place to vegetate and it just started to naturally kind of evolve uh, in the design. So the fact that it's a perfect square, I know David and Jacqueline can appreciate that's one of our first perfect <laughs> square houses. So that's that gets us very excited as well. But yeah, the fact that that it, that it, the whole well is vegetated um, is is exciting for us. That's very cool. Very cool. And uh, David, did you want to comment on uh, a recent project that you're proud of, and you know, just any integrations that were unique to well-being in any way? Yeah, you know, it's it's maybe less about a specific project that comes to mind, and more about um, how that shows. You know, how um, we achieve health and and happiness and all those things, and I think. Some of our projects are really obvious. You know, they're they're either really obvious, beautiful pieces of architecture, or they're really obvious health. And so I think there's kind of a different lay to to what's perceived and what's kind of obvious. Everyone can kind of see that this is this you know bright, open, healthy home. And then there's some kind of more subtle wins that I think we get in architecture too. You know, that's I think. When we're in the field, we can kind of see what drove the programming, what drove the final results. And sometimes there, it's it was a it was a tight budget. It's a tight client. It's a tight site. Um, just like what John mentioned there is being being able to create that light where you may not be able to get it in a traditional manner. You know, being able to get that healthiness. So I think for the most part, it's it's just kind of understanding what we're up against and achieving as much of that health and wellness as possible versus, you know, it doesn't always have to be obvious. I think it, it's, it's knowing who it's for and, and how we achieved it. So I think that's just the common goal. And that's part of the reason to work with, you know, professionals because we do value that stuff. And I think it's really easy to get kind of bulldozed over and, start to value some of these things that are less important in, in projects. But very Marco, welcome. I would say with that, a lot of our very healthy homes have Marvin windows in them. Oh, that's very cool. <laughs> right. shameless. That's a cheat by David right there. That is, well, <laughs> shameless well played, plug. David. <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, well, I thought I'd just wrap, maybe Jacqueline, you could close with uh, a couple minutes and uh, just commenting, where do you see the future of not just well, but of well-being and design in general? And you know, what does the next 10 years look like? Well, I mean, I think, like I said, I mean, we would have never have wished to, to be in a health crisis such as this one, um, but it's really amplified our work. Um, and you know, we, we were on an upward trajectory even before the pandemic and even before COVID, um, you know, hit the world. Um, but, but it's really kind of put us in a place where, like I said, it's sort of foundational. And so, um, you know, what we'll continue to do and, you know, I have, we haven't talked a ton about the technical aspects of, of the program, but what we'll continue to do is pull the best research. I mean, the thing about, well, and I appreciate Marco, you giving a plug of visiting our website. Um, we really, um, and also appreciate that it's written in, in a language that even um, homeowners can can understand is that that's one thing that we've really been focused in on is, is not um, making it so technical that it's unapproachable. 
Um, but at the same time, it is technical um, because we are pulling in the best evidence um, and research that exists on any given topic uh, within the building standard. That includes air, water, nourishment, light, fitness, comfort, um, community and mind, all of these topics that we feel are sort of holistic when it comes to designing, operating, and sort of, you know, administering an organization that's focused on, on healthy occupants, whether that's um, in a multifamily setting, whether that's um, an, you know, an education setting, um, sports venues, so, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we have, we'll continue to fall back on the evidence um, because that's really where we hang our hats, that we're an evidence-based standard. We'll continue to pull, you know, even better research that, that comes about and particularly around COVID. I mean, it's kind of amazing to think about all of the things that we were doing back in March and now we know a lot more um, about how to, to behave, how to be. Um, you know, not that everyone follows the rules, but we, um, we know a lot more, even in nine months. And so we will continue to iterate, we'll continue to leverage our um, network and our um, teams of people that we've pulled together with various expertise, whether that's in-house um, at the Well Building Institute or our advisors on the outside. So, you know, we'll continue to iterate. We'll, we're, we'll focus also on how we can continue to make our programs flexible for um, hospitals and healthcare, as well as warehouses um, and residential to some extent, certainly, because um, we do have a multifamily program. Um, but you know, we'll we'll just continue to keep pushing the the boundary on healthy buildings, and and you know, as far as I'm concerned, that it's here to stay. I hear you. And you know, we had a great question from uh, Ann Rausch in our Q and A that I think might be a good follow up question on that, Jacqueline. And that's you know, a lot of us are are fortunate that we can work from home. We talked about a couple people on this discussion that we know that maybe work from home their whole lives, but there are a lot of those who work for a living out there. We're on the front lines of this pandemic, and could Jacqueline maybe you just speak to some of the you know healthcare workers and nurses and, and healthcare spaces and maybe just anything unique that you might see coming or that's already developed in response to those challenges? Yeah, good question. You know, it's funny here at Well, I mentioned I've been on the team for a number of years and we've been talking about healthcare um, and having a standard dedicated to healthcare for a number of years. And it's also the scariest um, to even approach definitely, I mean, even before COVID <laughs> and even before the, our current crisis. Um, but what we have done, we've finally gotten to the place we have, um, we will be launching a healthcare focused advisory next year. So what that means is that a number of experts in the field, whether they're architects or designers or healthcare owners, um, will join us in talking us through and, and giving us advice on where we go with that program that's dedicated to the healthcare environment. Um, because certainly that is one area that we know that we haven't addressed um, in, you know, with a 10 foot pole even. So what we have, um, we've actually just closed the application process and we'll be launching early in 2021 in January, um, this discussion to not only talk about the topics, but really get into the technical details on how we can be focused in on health of in a healthcare setting. And that includes not just patients, but that also includes, you know, medical professionals, um, buildings, maintenance, so on and so forth. So we are focused in next year on, on that sector. Fantastic. It's very reassuring to, to hear. Uh, we had a, a question from Amber. I think I'll uh, pitch this to John. Um, she mentions that, you know, as we were talking about budget and value and importance, and maybe, you know, we were talking about the value of well-being, maybe that hasn't changed so much in your work over time, but how do you evaluate and make recommendations when there is need for value engineering or cutting something from the budget? You know, are you always responding to those requests with educational information? And just what does that value engineering of well-being and design look like? 
Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it's, it's something that, um, you know, it is definitely a, a constant struggle inside of the built environment. I mean, I think the reality is um, as new technologies come into play, they're usually at a premium and um, they do affect the bottom, you know, the, the budget of a project. And I think it's, it's our role uh, on the architecture side is to, to have these transparent conversations of, you know, maybe if you actually made your house 500 square feet smaller, um, we could then dedicate more to allocating um, some better fresh air intake or spending more on the systems of the home rather than just a magic number of square footage. I, I think um, that's something that we tried to, I don't know, David, if, if you run up against this a lot, but uh, we do um, constantly try to educate our clients that there are these kind of magical numbers that people have in their heads and they really don't bear out in the data. I think, you know, you can do a three family, a three bedroom home in, in 1600 square feet and everything feel very comfortable. And it's a very difficult number to wrap our heads around because, you know, as, uh, you know, as our lifestyles have changed, the, the square footage of the home has changed rap radically uh, in the last 30 years. But if we just took a step back and kind of reevaluated and based the home on natural light and based the home on the path of the sun, the home could feel extremely large um, very, very easily without having to waste square footage, which is going to waste budget. So I'd rather spend more of our allocated budget on systems that are going to improve the well being of the homeowner than on just making a large home for a large home's sake. I think David's point the other before about the four living rooms uh, resonates uh, probably with any architect just because that's a conversation that you have to have on a daily basis, that that is uh, inherently probably not needed. And there are better ways to allocate uh, the funds. Even if there is a significant budget, there are better ways to allocate the funds than just on kind of um, something that's perceived to, to add value, but we could actually find a better way to add that value. So that's something that we're always trying to challenging ourselves with. Great. And, and David, you know, like, like any good architect and you provide such good architecture, you can't put your finger on what it is when you walk into a space and especially someone who's not, you may be educated in, de in design and architecture in their background. It was just something that you know, makes you want to stay somewhere in a home, but, and can you just speak to maybe your conversations with clients as you get down to those construction documents and like how you guide those conversations based on budget and again, responding yeah. to the four living room question and maybe <laughs> suggesting alternatives. Yeah. You know, I think part of it starts with, you know, in the design world, I think we want to design jewel boxes. We want to design really beautiful, small detailed spaces that that are clever and meet people's needs we want to do those jewel boxes we don't want to do big dumb boxes you know there's that's that's against architecture so i think that's part of what we're trying to do is is what you know maybe that jewel box has a little bit of a different meaning now because we're caring about health and some of those things too so it's not just about the pretty finishes it's not just about the spaces but it's about what is the mechanical system what are the materials in there and like Jacqueline said whether it's VOCs you know this off-gassing all that kind of stuff are we are we paying attention to that to make sure it's a space that's beautiful and also provides you a quality life and you know, I think beyond that, it's just, it's really simple light. I mean, we love light and we, the sun's so important and it's movement and it's creating dynamic spaces. Um, I'd much rather have a very one dynamic space than four kind of boring spaces that are just stashed around the house. So I think, how do we create purpose, movement, compression and expansion and all these kinds of things? Um, and, and really it's about getting our clients on board with that and kind of informing of them of that. And uh, maybe part of it is even, yeah, we, we just have to make those, those um, kind of decisions sometimes and kind of push them in a direction. But it was interesting, a builder came in the other day and we had a rendering of a actually pretty 
thought through rendering. And he was like, huh, clients used to see it done when I finished it. Like that used to be his job. And now we're showing that. So I think there is a value in that though, because it's so hard for us to wave our hands around and do some drawings and explain how cool a space is going to be um, and how it can fill clients' needs um, until we can show them that. So I think um, while I resist technology, technology has been really great to allow us to kind of get our ideas out there and show clients that, that this volume is beautiful, this amount of space is sufficient, things like that. So it's really just, just informing, taking what our professional knowledge has given us and sharing it with, with the masses versus just you know some elite people that were kind of understanding this prior. Very well put, thank you, David. And uh, thank you everyone, we're at 12 noon. So uh, this wraps our discussion. Jacqueline, thank you so much. John, we so appreciate you being here. Uh, this was such a nice discussion. I'm hoping we can have more of them uh, down the road on different topics. Um, just wanna mention, we observe over the last five years, you know, larger glass to wall ratios than ever. I think if you looked at where energy was going, energy code, you might think there'd be less windows, but people want more expanses of glass and more daylight uh, than ever. And, and we're certainly responding to that. So um, anyway, thank you all so much for your time. Feel free to reach out to uh, myself or the folks on the call if you have any questions on the content here. And we'll hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Thanks.